Hello world, welcome back to another tutorial. Today we're gonna to be talking about Fong shading. We're gonna get into the basics and math of Fong shading because I know all of you out there are trying to make these realistic looking objects in our 3D space and with our 3D engine, but we need some lighting in order to accomplish that. Uh, I was going to make this, you know, split out between ambient, diffuse, specular lighting, which are basically Fong terms, uh, but instead what I'll do is this whole episode is going to be dedicated to doing one single presentation on how Fong shading works as a formula. It's going to talk about what all the different mathematical components of the formula are and what each variable of that formula represents. Because if you look on the screen right now, it's a crazy formula and uh, I want to help you figure out how the hell this thing works um, over the period of the next, well, I guess four episodes. Uh, so if you like this episode, hit likes, hit thumbs up. Uh, if you want more of this content, go ahead and subscribe. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. So let's jump into it. Okay, before your very eyes right now is a gorgeous chest. Now this chest isn't real. Uh, I know it looks real. It's fake. It's generated in 3D with my, my engine. Um, and the lighting technique I'm using on it right now is Fong shading. And so what is Fong shading? Well, it's a basic lighting algorithm that allows you to make objects in your 3D realm look like a light is being shined off of them. Um, it was developed at the University of Utah by Bui Tong Fong in 1973, which outstandingly enough was 50 years ago. Uh, you know, there was not graphical video games 50 years ago, at least that I know of. And, you know, they were developing this sort of stuff to be used in the future. The problem with Fong shading is that it's not a realistic looking algorithm. Uh, as you can see before you, it's somewhat cartoonish. It does give you the sense of light, but it's not really light. It's super smooth. You know, in, in real life, objects have light rays bouncing off of them in all directions. This one's very consistent and smooth. So it looks pretty fake. Um, so it's not a common algorithm to be used today, but it is a really good beginner shading lighting uh, algorithm to kind of get familiarized with lighting. Let's break down this Fong shading formula. Uh, Fong is made up of ambient, diffuse, and specular lighting values. Uh, and what that looks like is this. So we have ambient, diffuse, specular, all added together, summed up to make Fong. Okay, so let's start with ambient. Ambient is going to just be basically the environmental lighting. Most often in this lighting technique, it's going to be the backs of our objects, stuff that's not facing the light. Now. When it comes to diffuse, that is the surface that is facing the light. So as you can see in the image in the center, the back of this object isn't lit at all. It's completely black, but the front of it is. And if you look at the image at the bottom that has sums up the ambient and the diffuse so far, you'll see that it's a lot dimmer with the ambient and then the faces that are facing the light are a lot brighter. And last but not least is our specular value. Now the specular value is just the reflection of the light into your eyes. So when you look at an object, you can basically see the reflection of the light in that surface. And so that's what the specular value is going to be. So breaking down the Fong shading formula, it's fairly simple, ambient, diffuse, specular. Now, if you head over to the most wonderfully accurate page on the earth about Fong reflection model uh, at Wikipedia, you will find this gorgeous gem um, where it has all these different values that describe this function at the very bottom. Uh, and this function, if I blow it up for you, is somewhat intimidating. Uh, when I first saw this formula, I said, I'm not doing it this way. I'm gonna go and copy paste a bunch of code from all over the internet and try to figure out what it does. I couldn't figure out what it did. So I had to come back to this page and figure out what this math formula did. So I'm here to share it with you. And all this math formula is, is that same exact formula that I showed you in the previous slide. It is ambient plus diffuse plus specular. Now it's kind of hidden in there. Um, you might be able to spot it, but uh, we're gonna go through this in this entire video. So don't, you know, you know buckle your seat belts. It's gonna be a little rough. Uh, but before we talk about, you know, the intricate details of this formula, there are some math concepts that we need to understand. So let's break out six basic math concepts for Fong shading. So this is how we're going to be reading this formula. Uh, first one's gonna be vectors, second one's gonna be normals, dot product, vector subtraction, normalizing, and summations. Okay, I shouldn't have made that automated, that was ridiculous. But these are our six basic math concepts for Fong shading. Uh, jumping into vectors first, because I think that's the most basic one to understand, and you probably know what it is. 
you know, just it's going to be quick. Don't worry about it. So vectors. If you look at this little V right here uh, with a hat on top of it, that's going to represent a vector. And all a vector is, is it's the direction and the magnitude. A vector is just direction and magnitude. And as said by Vector from Despicable Me, it is both direction and magnitude. Thought that would be perfect for this. Uh, all right, so vectors are direction and magnitude. This right here is going to be vector A, where um, it's, the vector is pointing in the 0, 1, 0 direction. And 1 is going to be the magnitude or the length of the vector, because all it does is goes to 1, right? Uh, when it comes to vector B, this is going to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and 0 in the Z direction. And it is of length 0 0.5, because that's, you know, if we do some vector math, that's length of 0 0.5. So it has a direction and a magnitude. Now, what it doesn't have is a position. So all of these B vectors are equal to each other. They're all one vector. It's not like multiple types of vectors. These are all the same because there is no position on a vector. And just one final example is going to be the vector C, which is pointing in negative 1 on the x-axis. And since it's negative 1, that's going to be of a magnitude of 1. So, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Airplane, let's just give you a little example. If you've ever seen the movie Airplane, there's this really quick clip that is really funny, but it describes vectors so perfectly. LA departure frequency, 123.9er. Roger. Huh? Request vector. Over. What? Flight 209er, clear for vector 324. We have clearance, Clarence. Roger, Roger. What's our vector, Victor? Oh man, that is so perfect. Basically what they're just talking about, uh, what Clarence is talking about, is the vector in which the airplane needs to go. So, uh, the vector is going to be how far they need to go, and in what direction are they starting. So if the plane was taking off from Los Angeles, which direction do they need to start going now, and how far do they need to go? So it's going to have that direction and magnitude. So that ends our journey through vectors. Cross that out. Let's jump into normals now. All right, so if you've never heard of a normal, basically it's just a vector, as you can see from this beautiful red N with a hat on top of it. That's a vector. A normal is a vector. And all it is, it's a vector perpendicular to a plane. Say we have a plane, or I guess you could also say tangent, but in this case, let's just use plane. No using of the word tangent. Let's not confuse people. But we have a plane. A plane being a gra the ground or any, any surface. And we have a plane. And we have this arrow. Well, this arrow is our normal. Uh, because it's perpendicular to that plane, it is a normal. Uh, and this normal, in this case, is a float 3, which is 0, 1, 0, where it's 1 pointing straight up because the plane is horizontal and the normal is vertical. It's perfectly vertical, 90 degrees. Okay, So that's what a normal is. And if you look at this normal right here, you'll see that it's positive 1 on the x-axis because the plane is vertical. It's straight up and down. And the 90 degree angle makes it so that the normal is 1, 0, 0. Uh, in the case of a mesh or a primitive that we're drawing on the screen, uh, each you know the triangle in front of you has three normals, for one for each face. So every face has a normal, um, which is just the vector perpendicular to the plane of that triangle. Now, if we have a curved surface, you may be thinking to yourself, well, it's impossible to determine what the normal is of a, no, that's, stop it, stop it. This curved surface, you can still figure out what the normals are on the plane. You just have to break it down into small pieces. As you can see, I added these little white lines across the surface, and on these white lines now, I can add a normal, because all they are is they're the tangent of that curve, and if I get rid of the line, you'll see they still make up that curve, because the normals themselves still exist. Um, how does this work with our graphics engine? Because, you know, before we had colors, when we pass them through the vertex shader into the rasterizer, the rasterizer then interpolates the colors um, and also figures out where to color in, and then once it hits the fragment shader, it colors them in, and it generates, you know, an interpolated color for this triangle. Uh, well, the same goes for the the normals. If we just do the same exact process, pass the normal into the rasterizer, the rasterizer is going to interpolate them across normal 1, normal 2, normal 3, and it's going to create these surface normals all around the entire object that are interpolated normal values. Now, one thing to note is these normal values are not normalized. And I'll talk about normalization coming up pretty quick. 
Uh, but these are the surface normals that get generated through the rasterizer out into the fragment shader. One last little visualization I'd just like to show you is, say we have this cube with normals facing in all these directions on the cube. Well, if we interpolate them across the entire surface, basically it's just gonna look like this. So this is a really good just understanding of how these normals are gonna get interpolated and what the final value is going to be. Now that we're done with normals, let's cross that off and jump into dot products. What the hell's a dot product, dude? Uh, well, a dot product is actually a scalar product. If we take the formula 3x, 3 is going to be the scalar of x because it's going to be 3 times whatever value. x is going to be th the size of 3 times. If it's 4 times x, it's 4 times. That's the scalar. 4 is the scalar. Um, so in this case, a dot b, this is a scalar value where the dot is going to be this little red dot. It's not a, That's not multiplication. This is dot. And what dot, like the, the basic formula for dot, looks like this. Now, we're not going to dive too much into why this works. But just know that dot product means the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of theta. Okay, because cosine of theta is between negative 1 and positive 1. And we'll see why that's important in just a second. But this is the base underlying formula of the dot product. Basically... You have one at the top and negative one at the bottom and then zero in the middle. If we have vector A and vector B facing in any one of these directions, we can figure out what that dot product is going to be. Uh, if both of these vectors are facing in the same exact direction, uh, in this case pointing towards one, uh, and they're parallel to each other, the resulting value is going to be one. They're both facing one, it's going to be one. Now, if they're perpendicular to each other, now you see the green line is going towards the zero. The smallest value to be returned is going to be zero. And uh, if you know, like, cosine of pi over 2, that's going to be 0. So it is related to the cosine. And if they're facing in the opposite direction, it's going to be negative 1. If they're at the halfway vector, it's going to be 0 0.5. And you can kind of figure out that each one of these values is just based off of this graph and what it returns. So I thought that was a pretty cool way of visualizing the dot product. Dot product done. Vector subtraction incoming. Uh, so when you're doing lighting graphics, it's really good to understand how to do vector subtraction. And um, so what I did was I gave you a little lighting example. So say we have a light source, which is the orange dot, and we have an object, which is the green dot. And we want to figure out the direction or the direction and magnitude of the vector V from the object to the light source because we need to do some lighting calculations on that surface right now. Well, we know that the light source is at H vector, vector H, and I named it that for a reason. Uh, vector h and we know that the object is that vector t so what we need to do is we need to get the vector v from t to h and a really simple formula for that is going to be vector v equals h minus t and i came up with a nice little mnemonic thanks to my buddy sabian for helping me out with this i didn't really come up with it uh but if you look at this little mnemonic you'll see that the arrow is facing in one direction and the cat is facing in one direction. The head of the arrow and the head of the cat are facing in the same direction. So if I want to get the head of this arrow, I do head minus tail, and that's going to point me towards the head. So start with the head minus tail points toward the head. Now, if that doesn't make any sense, it's okay. It's just a mnemonic. It's just to be supposed to help you with memorization but that's how i visualize it in my head when i'm trying to figure out which way a vector is going so that's going to be vector subtraction the next concept i want to cover is normalizing now i know you're thinking to yourself we already covered normals dude why are we covering normalizing uh well because normalizing and normals they're different uh normalizing is not really a normal uh the idea of normalizing is based around this so say we have this three-dimensional graph with x y and z coordinates and we had this vector pointing off in the direction 4, 2, 4, where 4 is the x-axis, 2 is the y-axis, and the other 4 is going to be the z-axis. It looks something like this. And uh, from this, we can derive that the length of this vector is not 1. And I'll show you why in a second. But the goal of normalizing is to get the vector of length of 1. Right now, for the vector 4, 2, 4, if we do the you know, magnitude calculation, we come up with six. So the length of the vector right now is six. We don't want that. Because say we want to do the dot product between two vectors, uh, and one vector is two, and another vector is ten, length of two and length of ten. Well, when we do the dot product, the scalar value between those is going to be way off because they're not equal to each other, and they're scaling differently. So that dot product's not going to return the right number. 
So what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to get this from you know 424 to a value that's the same direction and but a different magnitude. We need to get to a magnitude of one. And so what we can do is we can call normalize on our vector and that will return a normalized value. And this value derives from one divided by the magnitude of our current vector times the vector. So one over six times four to four, and that's gonna get us two thirds, one third, and two third, which is basically this down here. So the range is gonna be from negative one to positive one. The vector is now one of length, of length one. I hope that made a little bit of sense. So the goal of when you're normalizing something, you're just trying to normalize it to be in one length. So now that we're done with normalizing, let's go ahead and put that back down and cross it out and move on to summations. Oh my God, get ready to have your minds blown, people, because summations are crazy. Okay, they're not that crazy. Basically, all a summation is, is it's an addition of any sequence of any kind of number. So it's just adding numbers together. Okay, that's what a summation is. Now, if you've taken calculus, you'll know what this is. You'll know it looks like this little E. It's like really cool looking E with epsilon. And basically all it is is a for loop. So anytime you see a summation, just know it's a for loop. And in this for loop, you're adding things together. It's pretty easy to understand. Uh, so here's that crazy formula from the beginning of the tutorial where I showed you Fong equals this craziness. And you see there's this epsilon value in there. And underneath that epsilon, you see M with a lowercase epsilon. That's the ME. That's the lowercase epsilon, which is basically just think of it as like M in all of the, that's what the E stands for, and then lights. So M in all of the lights. And inside of there, we have L of M, I at M, R at M, and I at M. So these are all the M's that we're using for all of the lights. So it's just a for loop over all the lights in our Fong formula example. Spoiler alert. Um, if we want to jump into some sort of a coding example, where we have epsilon number in nums, and we just sum up the num. So let's look at some code. If we have nums, which is an array of integer, and it's equal to three, four, five, and six, and we want to sum all those values together using a summation, well, uh, we're, we're gonna create a global variable called summation, and it's gonna be set to zero. And then for the num in nums, summation plus equals the num. You know, if you know code, this makes perfect sense. And the final summation is going to return 18, which is just 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6. That's going to be the summation. So that's all summations are. They're not that scary. They're not that crazy. Um, they're just epsilon-y. So now that we got summations out of the way, all the six basic math concepts for Fong shading are complete. But we're not done yet. We need to jump into how to read the Fong formula given those things that I just told you. So at the beginning, I said that the intensity of Fong equals the intensity of ambient plus the intensity of diffuse plus the intensity of specular. And then I told you that this formula was equal to the formula above. Now, how the hell is it equal? Well, if you look closely, you'll notice that ambient is located here on the formula. Diffuse is located here and specular is located here. So each one of these different sections represents a different part of that Fong formula. So if you kind of just break out the dots and the vectors and the, uh, the epsilon and all that stuff from this function, you can derive exactly how to figure this out. And if I give you these values, you can probably figure it out on your own. Now I'm not saying that's mandatory or anything, but you totally could. Uh, I've given you the Fong identifiers, the values, and the vectors all on this screen. You can take a screenshot of it if you want, um, and then try to go and implement it yourself using the shader. If you you know can't figure it out, that's perfectly fine. I'm going to make ambient, diffuse, and specular videos. Don't worry about that. But uh, I hope you like this video. This took kind of a long time to put together. Sorry about that. Uh, I've been through so many different types of PowerPoint presentations or keynote presentations on how I was going to describe this to you. So I figured I would just talk about the math, the math behind this, and then we'll dive into how to implement the algorithms ourselves, uh, which isn't that hard once you understand the basic underlying concepts. So I'm going to just leave it there. And uh, yeah, see you in the next episode.